it's great to see such a great group on here today. Wow, this is, uh, I think, going to be close to one of our largest. I think during the pandemic, we hit, you know, maybe 1,400, but 1,200 registered today. I see we're coming up to 450 attendees. So thank you all for registering and joining us here at the Tree Fund webinar series. So my clock is reading 12 noon, at least here in the central time zone. It might be a little bit different as I see people from joining us from all over. Welcome to the Tree Fund webinar series. It is a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of Auburn University. My name is Bo Broadbeck. I'm an extension specialist uh, here at Auburn University. And as always, we are proud uh, to be hosting this phenomenal webinar series um, in collaboration with Tree Fund. So this is the Tree Fund webinar series. Um, and with us today, we will have two presenters uh, looking at non-invasive tree root detection and what is the state um, of the art with that process. And so it's gonna be a fantastic presentation. And before I jump into it and introduce our speakers, I wanted to take a second to do a little bit of housekeeping um, as is our tradition on here on this webinar series. So real quick, um, and I'd like to first, uh, before I introduce myself any further, I'd like to introduce Heath, who is with Tree Fund. Uh, many of you um, knew some of our predecessors at Tree Fund, but Heath has been with us here for um, about six weeks. And so it's great, or a little more than that, maybe a couple months. And so it's great to have Heath to be my collaborator here on the Tree Fund webinar series. So welcome, Heath, and thank you for, for your help on this webinar series. Um, as this slide says, I do serve right now on Tree Fund's Board of Trustees. I'm chair-elect and will be chair um, actually once again next year before I roll off the Board of Trustees at Tree Fund. Um, with our webinar series, we will have one more this year. We will have another uh, researcher with us, uh, Dr. Jason Gordon, a good friend of mine over at the University of Georgia, um, who was funded a couple of years ago and has been doing some really interesting work on engaging underserved populations in community tree management activities. And so I think it's gonna be a great perspective. And it's one of the wonderful things that we have here with the Tree Fund webinar series is this series was developed to help uh, practicing arborists in the community understand the linkages between the research that is funded by Tree Fund um, and the work um, that is done. So we get a chance for y'all to see some of this new and emerging research. Um, in some cases, it's, it's just been recently published. I know not everybody has access to some of those journals. So it's an inside look at some of this research and why it's really important to support Tree Fund. As many of you know, Tree Fund is a philanthropic organization um, that raises money to fund research like the project we're going to hear today, like Dr. Gordon's work that we're going to hear in December. Um, and you can go back and look at a lot of the other research that has been funded. We have these webinars recorded. We record them every time. So you can go back and see Dr. Kathy Wolf's work, some things that have been done by Jim Urban, Ed Gilman, any number of researchers who have gotten funds from the tree fund. And so it's important to remember that this is possible because of people like you and I who support the tree fund. We donate to the tree fund um, to help fund some of this research that uh, we share with you today. So I just give that as a little caveat. Um, I know that Heath normally will put something in the chat box, which is a real quick way for you to support Tree Fund. So we would appreciate it if you can. A couple things. I know many of you are on here for some continuing education credits. And yes, we are pre-approved for some ISA credits. Um, a couple things to note. You do need to stay on for the entirety of the webinar. Um, if you get knocked off, please join back in. This system will tell me how long you have been on here, and ISA asks that you be on here for the entirety of the webinar. So if you leave 20 minutes early, we may not be able to assign you CEUs. So be cognizant of that. And also, when you make sure when you entered those CEUs, it should have been part of the registration process. You, ISA has asked that we enter the information correctly. Um, and not leave out the dashes or the spaces that are required. So just pay attention to that and enter it just like it shows on your credentialing card. 
So with that being said, um, oh, and I will also note before I introduce today's speakers, this is being recorded. I know I had some emails from people in Australia saying, you know, it's going to be 3 a.m. in Australia. I really don't want to be up at that time watching this webinar. Can it be recorded? Yes, we do record it. And we record it because there's people from all over who are either busy, can't be here. And we place those recordings um, on the Tree Fund site. Just go to treefund.org, go to the webinars tabs, and you will see the recordings of past webinars. Usually give us a couple of days to post those on the system. So it takes us some time to generate it and get it loaded up, but it will be recorded. So with us today, we have uh, actually two presenters. So we get you know two for the price of one as they're going to be sharing some new and emerging research and some stuff that I think is absolutely fascinating uh, to talk about, which is non-invasive tree root detection and what is the state of the art. So it's it's one of those tools that we have in our boar culture to help us understand where are those darn roots potentially. And so with us today, we have uh, Dr. Andrew Millward, who is an associate professor of geography and the principal, inv principal investigator for the Urban Forest Research and Ecological Disturbance Group, or UFRED, um, at Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly Ryerson. He joined the Department of Geography at Toronto Metropolitan University in 2006 and established the UFRED in 2008. UFRED's primary focus is applied research that uses geospatial technology to document and explain urban forest presence and condition with the end goal of furthering the protection and enhancement of natural spaces within cities. And also with us today, we have Justin Myron, who is a PhD candidate at Toronto Metropolitan University and also a collaborative researcher um, with the for Urban Forest Research and Ecological Disturbance Group. So welcome to both of you. We very much appreciate you having on, on the Tree Fund uh, webinar today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, uh, Dr. Milward, and let uh, you and Justin uh, jump in and take over from here. Thank you. Well, I'll be beginning our presentation today. Hello to everyone out there. My numbers say 761 of you folks here. A, a great big welcome. Thank you for taking an interest uh, in our research focused on non-invasive tree root detection. Um, I'd like to also extend uh, thanks to both uh, Bo Heath and, of course, the Tree Fund uh, for inviting us to speak about this research today and also providing financial support to uh, contribute to the work that we're going to be sharing with you. So, um, Heath if, uh, or Bo, if I could uh, ask you to, uh, to throw up our first question uh, for, the, uh, for the audience today. Uh, we'd like to get a little bit of information about you folks uh, who are joined in uh, and interested in this topic. Great, so we'll just leave this up for a, a moment or two. Um, our interest is in knowing why, in fact, uh, you are interested in this topic. Why is root detection and mapping of interest to you? So the majority, it seems at this point, are indicating tree protection, followed by infrastructure uh, planning placement. Um, so if you want to, if you want to stop that, uh, that's great. Um, and a few of you then uh, researchers, so you'll uh, likely uh, be interested in a bit more of the technical information we'll uh, we'll share with you. And uh, we would welcome uh, an outreach from anybody in the research community following our our presentation. Uh, to uh, uh, potentially talk about what you're doing and maybe think about any uh, potential collaboration. Um, so with that said, then, if you could launch uh, question number two, uh, please. Question number two, if we could have... Um, Great. So uh, Justin and I would like to know how familiar you are with GPR and its use for tree root detection. Great. So as we anticipated, it looks like uh, quite a number of you are getting your first exposure into this. Uh, you know, some of you probably have seen this maybe in other presentations or heard it discussed, maybe read about it uh, in a, a trade publication or a journal article. Uh, and it does look like 28 of those of you who've responded have actually used it. So uh, that's really uh, interesting and important for us to know as we move through this and we can uh, try to speak to each of you in terms of where you're, uh, where you're coming from. So if we could stop sharing uh, question two right now, we'll jump right into things here. Oh, 
Okay, so uh, as uh, uh, Heath mentioned, uh, as Bo mentioned, um, I'm Andrew Millward, a professor of geography and environmental studies at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. And yes, we did recently go through a name change. Um, so I believe some of our earlier material may have listed our former name Ryerson, but we're located up in Toronto uh, in Southern Ontario. Uh, and uh, for the last 10 years or so, um, I've been focused a lot on the soil medium uh, and the, the importance of soil in terms of its contribution to uh, growing uh, and um, sustaining healthy trees uh, in, the, in the urban environment. So if we could move to the next slide, please. I think that would be you, Justin, um, yeah. moving the slides, please. Great. So um, to start off here, uh, we can show you diagrammatically here uh, what the tree fund has helped put together for us. Basically, we've got uh, a grand uh, sandbox here, or uh, what we like to think of as a sandbox, but um, more sophisticated than that, as, as you'll learn uh, in the coming, um, uh, the coming minutes. So uh, tree fund uh, invested in uh, our project, supported our project, uh, which is generally based around the ability to have a controlled setting uh, within which we can place uh, various things, roots, of course, but other objects. We can manipulate the soil conditions, uh, adding different types of soil texture, for example, uh, manipulating moisture conditions, uh, as well as then uh, looking at root responses to different types of uh, electromagnetic energy. Uh, and so that's what we're doing uh, in this setting. It's what we'll be talking about for the majority of our time uh, with you today. Um, but the idea here being that uh, the, uh, the use of GPR has, ad has advanced in the detection of tree roots. Uh, and, and there's certainly been quite a, a flurry of publications in recent years as it relates to its use. Um, but where we felt the, uh, the work was, uh, was somewhat limited is in the empirical uh, understanding verification of these results. So one could go and, they, uh, and uh, use a GPR unit to, uh, to scan an area and then excavate that area. That has obviously certain implications for, uh, for a living tree there uh, in terms of its uh, structure and potential impact to roots. Um, and that's been commonly done and probably most uh, reported on in the literature. Um, what's less reported on, though, is the approach that we're taking here, and that's the ability to, to very precisely position and understand where objects are buried, understand well the soil medium in which the objects are found, uh, and of course then the response that's provided uh, when we uh, send electromagnetic energy at it uh, through a, a GPR device. Um, so again, this is our, uh, our structural uh, root box, as we call it. Uh, and, and it's the source of information gathering uh, as we bring together uh, key elements uh, of what's necessary then to uh, identify roots or uh, other objects uh, and ultimately then sort of move them into a territory where we'd be able to uh, use those signatures as we refer to them um, to, uh, to develop uh, and enhance tools that uh, could lead to the automated uh, detection uh, of roots. So we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, here's a picture uh, on the left uh, of our actual root box. Uh, you can see then we've got our, our GPR unit uh, running on rails here. There are seven rails that exist uh, in parallel and the unit travels back and forth. We uh, also move it uh, in uh, alternating directions as well, uh, acknowledging that GPR signals are not um, always symmetrical depending on how you uh, interact or contact an object. So this box is about uh, 36 inches deep for those of you uh, operating in the imperial system, 36 inches of soil below uh, the top deck there that you see the unit sitting on. Uh, here we have some turf grass installed uh, on top of the soil medium uh, and under that uh, then we have various objects buried uh, included roots where those objects uh, are documented in great detail. Of course, uh, their size, you can see us uh, doing some measurements. Uh, one of our field assistants on the right here, 
measuring roots, uh, root diameter, length, uh, and the, uh, the overall shape, morphological characteristics of the roots. Uh, then when they're buried, we document their, uh, their orientation uh, and depth and distance along uh, the box as the, uh, the GPR unit would, uh, would move back and forth. And finally, once we're finished our experiment, then we actually uh, excavate those roots uh, and put them in a drying oven to determine uh, the actual moisture content. And we can compare the moisture content then of the roots themselves to our surrounding soil uh, matrix. On the right hand side, you can see some of the field assistants doing some of those measurements. And if you look carefully at the bottom right corner, you'll see some wires. Uh, those wires then are actually measuring soil moisture at different depths uh, in our root box, which we also use uh, in our broader collection of information uh, about the environment that uh, these roots exist in. So next slide. Okay, so at this point then I'm gonna turn uh, our attention to thinking about uh, with a, that bit of a preamble as to what we've actually done and how we've utilized support from the tree fund. Uh, what does success look like when we think about uh, developing a tool or further developing a tool uh, to detect uh, and potentially even map the locations of tree roots? So we've come up with three uh, bullet points here that, uh, that broadly identify what success might be. So tree root survey technology that enables uh, horizontal resolution uh, and characterization of tree root architecture. Um, at a minimum, a tree root survey that enables medium resolution uh, data uh, emerging as to where roots are, and especially even where they're not. And when we think about the reasons why people uh, identified uh, interest in joining this, uh, this particular webinar, uh, there was a strong uh, emphasis toward tree protection, but that was followed fairly closely by individuals uh, who may be interested in a technology like this to help with site planning, to help uh, thinking about tree roots and, and other infrastructure uh, and issues uh, as it may relate to, uh, to building construction. Um, so identifying with some uh, level of confidence where there are no tree, tree roots or especially no structural tree roots can be of great value. And finally, having a tool that's automated uh, and cost effective. So we want to, uh, or for success anyway, have a tool ultimately that uh, can be deployed by individuals uh, with some level of competence um, without necessarily having a, uh, a, a very deep uh, or um, complicated uh, need for uh, understanding of how ground penetrating radar works and uh, and how the ultimate locations uh, are assembled in terms of where roots and other objects may be. Uh, and of course, this needs to be cost effective and practical, doesn't it? So for anybody who may consider a technology uh, in, in the sort of practitioner world, uh, of, uh, of surveying, uh, you need to be able to have something that can um, be delivered up to a client uh, in a cost-effective way, uh, and also in a way that, uh, that is timely in nature. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide then, uh, and I'll ask uh, our, um, uh, our host, uh, Heath uh, uh, or Bo, to uh, launch our third question. And that question is asking you then what you think best describes a typical root morphology. Um, so a lot of us, especially depending on where we're coming from, uh, will have an idea of what roots may look like uh, under the ground. The vast majority of the public, again, as I think probably most of you on this webinar will know, uh, don't really have an impression of how roots can spread, how they can uh, actually be found in quite interesting places, uh, often at distance uh, from a tree. So we wanted to get an idea of where you think a typical tree root uh, may, uh, may actually be found. Soils can have a big impact, of course, then we know that uh, trees growing in sandier soils may have a tendency to put down deeper root systems to access water. Um, on the other hand, then uh, the, the context of thinking about, you know, as a lay person, as a member of the public, or even as many people in the construction industry may look at trees and uh, 
thinking about how to protect them above ground, um, you know, very little thought, uh, very little uh, understanding exists as to what uh, what may exist uh, below the ground surface. So, wh so what have you folks said here? The majority of you saying roots grow laterally from the tree uh, base at a modest soil depth. And I think under many conditions, that's probably true. Um, the second most commonly answered or selected response was root morphology is not easily anticipated. And I think that's something in an urban context, which, uh, which Justin, my, um, my colleague who's going to be taking over in just a second, will likely speak more about is that in an urban context with so many obstacles uh, under the ground, so many differences in uh, soil structure that may be uh, evident over a, a small geographic area, uh, tree roots are not always easily anticipated. Um, but I think also it's very fair, and I'm glad to see that, uh, that many of you answered that uh, roots do grow laterally. And that's probably the most common misconception is that many people, uh, many people think that, uh, you know, that roots actually uh, are fairly concentrated and grow below a tree. So, you know, you can approach uh, the main stem of a tree with various activities and maybe not have a huge impact on the tree. Um, and so that's, uh, that's something certainly that, uh, that we hope to, and I know that many of you in your own uh, education of clients, et cetera, uh, are liking, uh, likely to share then uh, the, the notion then that, um, you know, that, that tree roots actually uh, can migrate quite a distance from the tree. And it's very important that we understand that. Radar in this case, non-invasive methods such as GPR uh, are one approach to do that. Uh, and that's where we'll be taking the presentation from now. I'm gonna be uh, passing the microphone uh, to, to Justin uh, and, uh, and he's gonna speak to you about our conceptions of tree roots. Uh, he'll talk to you about GPR uh, in more detail and then we'll round off with more details about our project that I uh, introduced to you a few minutes ago. So Justin, I'll, I'll pass things over to you. Thanks, Andrew. And I realize everybody probably only sees my name on the uh, on the image here. I don't have an image <laughs> associated with you or no, no, no camera. I'm sorry about that. I seem to be just as opaque as roots can be sometimes. But uh, I'm hoping that uh, my voice will suffice for the remainder of the presentation. Um, as Andrew said, uh, it is very difficult to actually anticipate or even to understand how a root system in any one particular context and, and also in urban contexts might actually form under the ground. There are rules of thumb that do exist in many contexts about how best to anticipate uh, a root system and how it might actually happen underground. Um, I'm sure many people are familiar with what is called critical root zone or the, the areas of the tree that should not be touched in any sort of uh, disturbance activity. So um, the drip line, for example, the area of the tree canopy that falls above the ground is often said to be the most vulnerable to disturbance. Um, however, um, in the real world and not in the conceptual world, in the real world, roots, any particular root system might be vastly different from, from how it's depicted in this particular image. Um, you might have a root that is completely, or a root part of the root system that is completely dependent on one lateral root that spreads to a far off area of a site. For example, the tree might have for years been drawing nutrients in water uh, from a septic tank or from some sort of burst pipe. Um, and so in that case, if you are to do work around a tree, you might not know where this critical root zone actually lies. Uh, this is a great rule of thumb, but what we probably need at this point is a way to detect and to do a proper tree root survey um, in any case, uh, in order to avoid uh, making the mistake of inadvertently killing a tree by destroying its uh, primary root system. And so this is actually an example of, of uh, a set of Kentucky coffee tree specimens that Andrew and I actually excavated um, several years ago on a site in uh, southwestern Ontario. And this is really just to demonstrate how 
how much of a conundrum root systems can be in the real world. Uh, in this case, uh, this is actually, I think, one tree um, that has cloned itself, um, or it might actually be a few of them, I can't quite remember. But um, the, the, the root system is uh, uh, several sets of uh, uh, spreading roots that uh, then send up um, clones uh, uh, throughout a, a certain part of a, of a particular site. And in this case, I don't even know whether the critical root zone would be considered to be within a drip line or whether it would be considered to be some far off area of this site. It, it, the, we were actually quite surprised when we, when we took a look at this root system using a, an air spade. Um, in this case, the roots were being excavated to actually move them to a site where they would not be disturbed uh, in the future. This was a construction site. Um, but this serves to demonstrate how just how difficult it can be to apply rules of thumb to any particular concrete example on the ground. And then, of course, uh, um, in in the typical in the typical case, if if we wanted to know uh, where roots are, we could decide to dig them up. We could decide to daylight them, as it as it as we as we call it, um, by removing the covering material over roots. Um, however, this comes with several problems. One of them is it is expensive and it is hard to daylight a tree root system. But even more fundamentally, it is actually a it moves against the whole reason why we might be trying to protect a tree in the first place. If we daylight a tree, we might end up injuring or destroying the tree in the process. And so uh, there, is, uh, there is a need to uh, develop technology that can allow us to know where roots are, or at least with confidence, with some level of confidence, know where roots are without having to remove material up, uh, around the tree. So this is where non-invasive detection comes into play. We don't want to be able to daylight roots or remove the covering material, we can damage the tree. But we also want to have the ability to deploy rapid and repeating surveys. Uh, in this case, if we were to remove material from every tree, I don't even know how many we could actually do in any, in any practical amount of time, but it would be very difficult to convince a client or any sort of uh, municipal body that you, you would be, you want to be able to remove essentially the soil around all the trees that they actually want to protect. So uh, the principles of a non-invasive technology is that it will allow you to see or at least to know where the roots are without having to do any of that. Now, given that, there are several non-invasive uh, observations that can be made any, uh, through varying technologies. GPR, which was mentioned by Andrew before, is one of these technologies, but it is not by any means the only one. There are several that are available currently in varying stages of development. Uh, the first two in this list, the pulling tests and the rhizotrons, uh, do involve, uh, they do involve some sort of manipulation of the root architecture system. The pulling test, for example, uses a, a, a weight or a, a force that's applied to the tree and then tests uh, the, uh, the, essentially the structural integrity of the soil around it. And in that way, you can determine or you can try to determine where the roots are exerting most of the structural force to keep the tree standing. Uh, this is one way that you can use, uh, uh, you can use this method to at least anticipate where most of the root structure is doing its work. Rhizotrons, on the other hand, uh, um, do it, involve uh, excavating a very small amount of soil in order to uh, essentially take a picture underground of a, of a small sample area around a tree. And that's why these two asterisks are next to these. These ones will involve manipulation of the root system. The last four that are listed here, acoustics, electrical resisti resistivity, tomography, x-ray computed, uh, computed tomography, and of course, ground penetrating radar, uh, don't typically result in any sort of disturbance. And so I'm actually going to go through these uh, in a bit more detail uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, several slides. 
So a pulling test, as I said, uh, usually involves applying a force to a tree to understand where it, where the soil then is disturbed uh, uh, around the tree. And uh, in so doing, we can understand, uh, uh, have, a, have a more coarser understanding of, of basically where the biggest roots are. And uh, this usually involves tying a cable or some other, um, uh, some other structural device to another tree in order to exert the pull. Um, this is usually for tree safety purposes. So the idea here is to determine what trees are at risk of falling or which ones are at risk of being damaged in any sort of other mechanical way. Um, uh, it, it, it doesn't explicitly have the goal of understanding tree root architecture, but in any case, you can determine and in, in maybe in, in sort of a where around the tree, where these where, where most of the roots are. A rhizotron, as I said, uh, involves taking a small sample of or picking a small area around a tree rather and taking a sample picture of how the re tree roots are developing. These can be deployed in any part around the tree, um, but of course it would have to be, you would have to be quite uh, considerate and careful about where you're placing the rhizotron, or in this case, it's actually much more of a mini rhizotron. Uh, uh, you would have to be careful about where you placed it, um, both for understanding uh, how the root systems actually are. So you would want to make sure that you sample correctly, but also that you would want to make sure that you're not uh, likewise disturbing whole areas around this tree. This could also be difficult in an urban context, depending on what else is around uh, the, uh, the tree. Uh, a rhizotron works on the principle of feeding in a fiber optic cable into uh, uh, essentially a mirrored or a, a, an optic tube, and, uh, and then pictures can be taken uh, from that. Electrical resistivity tomography is an interesting one. It uses the principle of running an electric current uh, uh, through uh, and around the root system uh, at a particular point. And uh, because electricity is running through a medium, it slows down or it speeds up depending on what is in the soil. So the principle here is that uh, roots actually uh, allow a, a, a current to pass through quicker. And so you can develop essentially a map of where the most resistance is. And so having an understanding of how certain materials under the ground uh, either impede or allow for uh, 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 electricity um, will, will give you an idea of, of where roots are most likely to be. In this case, this is actually taken from another paper, as I know at all, in 2008. But the areas of the least resistivity are the areas where it's most likely to be, where there are most likely to be roots around this particular tree. And uh, in like GPR and, and, like, uh, and like some of the other, say, soil trenching methods, um, the idea is to create a, 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 essentially a virtual trench where you can, where you can analyze uh, where the, the different resistivities are. X-ray computed tomography is, is an interesting one. Um, this uses essentially X-rays to, uh, to image uh, root systems. In this case, uh, this image, Metzner et al. Uh, uh, analyzed small plants, small root systems in a, in a controlled X-ray uh, emitting environment. Um, I think it's an MRI scanner actually that was used in another instance. But uh, basically what these techniques rely upon is the ability to remove cores of soil around, uh, say, a tree system, or in, in most cases, a smaller plant, like a bean plant or, or a grass, and uh, to study the roots in detail using these imaging techniques. But it involves actually moving uh, soil from uh, one place to another. This would be, um, it, the reason why I don't class this as necessarily a, uh, an invasive and more of a non-invasive is that uh, in, this is usually not used for trees uh, simply because on a site you can't remove a tree root system and then bring it into a lab. However, there are, uh, there are scanning technologies that could be used uh, in and around in situ environments in, in the real world instead of having to bring them to a, lab, uh, to a laboratory, you could deploy a, an x-ray uh, system. Um, this is not 
typical though. So um, I would actually class this maybe potentially as a, an invasive slash non-invasive, depending on how it was used. But the technology is interesting because it uses uh, it uses a, a form of tomography, uh, the study of the shapes under the ground, and the study of the the um, the uh, X-ray system uh, outputs to to image the system in detail. And so this is actually a good example of where we might actually want to get to uh, when it comes to GPR, the ability to can reconstruct the root systems um, in their three dimensions. So ground printing training radar, this is what we've, what Andrew and I have chosen to focus on for our project. Uh, uh, this uses electromagnetic waves, it's not X-ray and it's not MRI. That's centered around a particular frequency, so it works in megahertz. We have an antenna that um, that emits uh, radar, and the principle is that it should be able to hit objects uh, under the ground, so roots or other objects that then reflect, and then that reflection energy is then uh, 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 put back um, is then sent back to a receiving antenna, uh, where an image is developed. What's called a radargram image. Uh, and these reflections are then used as the basis for determining where, where objects are, where roots are. Uh, in, in most GPR settings, we're using what's called a, uh, or a portable, a portable uh, antenna. And this antenna can actually be deployed in the field uh, using a, some sort of cart system. It doesn't have to be a cart, but something that allows basically the antenna to move along the ground surface. And as it moves along the ground surface, it uh, it continuously detects or it reflects off of objects that are under the ground. This is the way that it that it produces an image or essentially a virtual trench of the underground uh, environment. Now, the one big thing to understand about GPR is that it's not returning an image as if you were taking a picture with a camera. It's returning essentially what you might call echoes, reflections, and that data then has to be uh, um, interpreted by uh, by either an expert user in GPR, or it could be determined by a combination of an expert and some sort of uh, algorithm or filtering mechanism. It's usually the case that filters are used for this imagery, uh, and then a, an expert observer will then interpret the image. Our project um, is uh, primarily concerned with being able to put more work into the automation and the filtering and less into expert uh, interpretation. Uh, in this case, uh, a tree survey uh, would usually require uh, the GPR unit to be uh, deployed in some sort of geometry around the tree. Uh, typically, in our cases, uh, uh, we have tested uh, linear movements of the GPR unit. So this is a picture of uh, the GPR being deployed uh, around a tree uh, in, a, in, uh, in, a, in a linear in a linear form. Uh, it can also be uh, deployed in a circular form. So essentially, going all the way around the tree. Um, the benefits and, and, and the, even the drawbacks of these methods are, are really dependent on how the, uh, the images come about and, and whether, the, uh, whether the objects uh, that are being scanned um, are better scanned uh, in, in a line or whether they're better scanned um, uh, within a circle. So this is an example of the radargram image. This is an output from the GPR unit. And you can see how it's not a, a photographic uh, level uh, representation of the underground. Uh, this is what we work with uh, in GPR. Uh, in this case, uh, I wanted to just point out a few, uh, a few aspects of this image that are of interest. For one, uh, the ground surface in this image is simply a line that is uh, sort of at the top there, um, you can see how basically this, this whole ground has been reflected uh, when the radar is passed over it. Uh, the, uh, as the radar moves along the ground, uh, there's a small gap between the antenna and uh, the, the actual grass or the area where basically the electromagnetic waves start to impede as they start to enter the ground. 
And so this gives off a reflection of the ground surface that in, ends up in the GPR imagery. And part of the work uh, in GPR interpretation and in filtering is to remove this sort of object. Um, this is not an object of interest. We're not interested in where the ground is. We already know where it is. So uh, as an example here, this is, this is something we would want to remove. Um, and in fact, at the bottom of this image is another, uh, is another surface. This was taken from that root box that Andrew had described earlier. Uh, this is the bottom of the box. This, uh, the one near the bottom of this, of this image. Uh, it's made of wood. All it represents is the change in what's called the dielectric contrast. And basically, when a wave travels through a medium, when it slows down or when it speeds up, it will give a stronger reflection than others. So a GPR unit and the imagery that comes from it is working on the principle that there are contrasting elements within the underground environment. And as electromagnetic waves propagate, they will reflect and then repropagate and even scatter depending on what the contrasting aspects of those objects are. Each object has what's called a dielectric value. So water, for instance, impedes the movement of electromagnetic waves. If I were to hit an object with more water, it would give a very strong reflection in GPR imagery. And so a root given that in many cases might be more moist than other uh, elements around it, it is more likely to show up in GPR imagery. And that's what we're trying to uh, uh, pursue when, it, when, when we're doing this research. We're trying to see whether we can make root signatures appear clearer within this imagery. Um, this particular example, uh, uh, you can see this line that kind of moves through, uh, th through the image. The, the waveform as it travels through the ground will will give a, a wave, a wave or reflection wave uh, of, a, of a usually a higher amplitude, so of high, higher power that then we can view within the image. And this, this kind of dark, white, dark form is representative of when that wave hit uh, an area of high reflection, of high impedance. By the way, this is an example of a buried root in that box. So you can see how roots actually show up in these conditions. This was also a sand environment, a very, very dry sand environment. The roots were of high uh, contrast. Now, one thing that we often talk about when we talk about uh, GPR imagery is that the reflections that are coming back and generating these images aren't at first described as say roots or they're not described as pipes or walls. They're actually described as artifacts, image artifacts that then we have the challenge to classify and understand. So the whole project here with non-invasive detection, at least with GPR, is that we are, we are tasked with classifying artifacts, image artifacts. In many cases, moving across roots or pipes or anything that is linear in fashion, we were moving across it perpendicularly, we would see what's called a hyperbola. A hyperbola reflection is what that dotted line is sort of showing. And if, if you look at A, at the, at the letter A here, that is the actual location of the, of the, of the in this case, a root object. Um, but there's also this, these sort of these peripheral wings that are associated with this. And this is an artifact of the way that the GPR moves around and over that image. As it moves across, it's detecting that image. The beam of the radar is still picking it up, even though it's not right over it. So as you move across, you get this sort of signal that moves with the image. And removing these hyperbola artifacts is a critical uh, aspect of developing uh, accurate GPR imagery, at least accurate from the locational perspective. Being able to know exactly what produced that, that, that reflection is, is critical, but these are the sorts of artifacts that actually can confound and confuse an operator or even an automated detection algorithm. 
uh, from, and it, it would confuse them, but also would make it more difficult to understand where things are. So uh, this isn't the only, uh, this isn't the only output of a GPR unit. Uh, we can assemble uh, uh, 3D or uh, sorry, 2D imagery um, into what are called 3D, I guess, 3D C scans. Um, these are more three-dimensional representations that we that are made from the piecing together of these uh, more two-dimensional virtual trenches, these imageries that come from uh, GPR. And from there, we can deduce with more confidence where root systems are more likely to be. And so you can imagine setting up a GPR survey and deciding, oh, well, we have to not only just take one scan, we have to take multiple scans in order to have a better reconstruction, or at least to try to get a better reconstruction of what is going on underground. It's, it is, in a way, quite obvious that you would need to sample several locations around a tree in order to understand it. Uh, one of the nice things about GPR is that you could conduct a survey that did achieve uh, this sort of resolution uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to deploying and, and producing different virtual trenches. So in GPR, given the fact that we have artifacts that are uh, uh, that are potentially confounding confounding us, and we have artifacts that might that might signal false uh, false positives, um, the challenge that uh, that we have in this project is to improve the accuracy and resolution of, uh, of GPR uh, imagery. Uh, and so we want to know where the roots are, not necessarily where objects are. We want to know where what reflections actually signify roots and not any object. And so this project is this, this development of the root box is a way to refine and, and to identify the unique patterns associated with roots and not with things like pipes, not with things like bricks, and not with things like soil that doesn't have anything in it. Uh, and so in order to do this, we are tasked with identifying variables that influence how these roots are actually expressed in the imagery we produce. But these variables are, are numerous and, uh, and better understanding of how you're more likely to see a root in any one particular in situ in the field conditions is really important to improving detection accuracy. These are the main variables listed here. So when you are scanning with a GPR unit, the direction of the scan is something that will influence how a route will actually show up. The direction of the scan, whether you're going in east to west, you know, east, uh, west to east, north to south. Uh, the directionality is also uh, relevant when it comes to the shape of the scan that you're making. If I was to go in a straight line, I might hit a route at a not perpendicular aspect. I might hit it on an angular aspect. So <clears throat> understanding how that changes the uh, expression of the route is important. Uh, more fundamentally, the wave frequency of the radar antenna we're using is important. Uh, certain frequencies will not be able to detect roots as a rule. If I had wavelengths, for example, in say the 200 megahertz uh, range, these are probably not going to be able to detect roots of any size, maybe large ones, but of, of a smaller size, let's say two centimeters or below, it's unlikely that anything will show up in the imagery. The orientation and depth and the thickness of the roots themselves is also really important. So there's the scan geometry, for example, that 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 is important. But then there's also the orient. Like, is the root going downwards? Is it going upwards? Is it too deep to detect? That's another aspect that is really driving the research. Um, and the thickness of these roots as well. If there's an overly thick root, for example. Uh, you might see two signatures in your data, in your radiogram data. Is that two roots? Well, no, it's only one. So the ability to be able to differentiate between signals uh, and 
to identify when something is discrete root is highly dependent on understanding how orientation depth and the thickness impacts the final radiogram image expression. The presence of other objects is another aspect that often complicates the imagery. Uh, if we were to put two roots together or say on top of one another in, in say a scanning context, like in our box or in the fields, if you were to have that sort of situation, which is very likely, uh, the signal itself might turn into something that's more like seeing a soil horizon and not a root. Well, there are ways to account for that, but we don't have an understanding, at least a good enough understanding of how roots uh, show up and are expressed in conjunction with other objects, other roots or, 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 or other, other things like pipes, me metallic rebar, that sort of thing, stuff that you would very likely find in an urban environment. And as I mentioned before, we're working with contrasts. So, uh, and contrast is very much determined, at least in the case of ground penetrating radar, by things like moisture content. Uh, as I said, moisture uh, tends to impede the movements of waves, which means that they're more likely to reflect. So high moisture areas are more likely to show up in the imagery. If we were to have a, a root, let's say, that was buried in a wet soil, let's say a wet sandy loam, then will it show up? Will it be bright? Will the wave characteristics actually be able to show us that hyperbola structure that we saw earlier? Or is it is it going to be an extremely confused image? These are the variables that we're hoping to test in a statistical model as a part of this work in order to identify unique expressions uh, of roots so that we can, uh, well, so that we can recognize them in, in radiogram Im imagery as we continue with GPR work. And so this is the, the main thrust of this project. We want to build a controlled lab that systematically tests these variables. And so uh, if you can see here this picture of, of Andrew, we're, we're taking this, uh, we're, we've buried an object in, in the root box, and we've actually overlaid it with turf to see what the overlying material might do to the, to the signal. Um, this box allows for the modulation, the slight modulation in a lot of different contexts of these variables. And with enough data, we've collected hundreds already. Um, with enough data, we can build a statistical model that becomes predictive. It becomes predictive of what you're likely to see in imagery in these contexts. And from there, with these predictions, we can more confidently say when we are dealing with a root and when we're not. This is an example. I'm going to show you in the next several slides, several examples of of how this imagery actually comes up, <laughs> how it actually uh, comes alive. So um, uh, this is a diagrammatic sketch of that root box looking from the top. In this case, this is, this is an actual set of, uh, of, of observations that we made in the lab. So we used wet sandy loam with no sod on top. The objects were spruce roots. So sort of like the ones you saw when Andrew introduced, uh, introduced our project, we saw that student uh, measuring roots uh, that were going to be buried, and uh, we were taking precise measurements of those. Um, we buried three in this in this case, and we do seven with these these uh, uh, red lines that are um, shown on top of the box. We do seven passes in this direction at least, and the direction going from top to bottom. So uh, we had three objects all together in the same box, uh, and we wanted to see how they would appear in, in GPR imagery. So with the first, with the first image that we took uh, our first line kind of going near the edge of the box, you can see how, well, I guess the first thing you can see is that there's a lot going on in this image. Artifacts are in here everywhere. You have the ground surface, which is sort of right near the top of the image. You have a little bit of dark, a little bit of of, of, of brightness. That's actually the sand surface and it doesn't look like a straight line like the one you saw. It actually doesn't look like a straight line at all. It looks like it could be a root, but it's not. It is, these are variations in the potentially the moisture of the soil at that level. Um, potentially also the level, the, the actual evenness of the surface within the box. And then as you go further down, 
uh, and it says here on the image the depth in centimeters. That's the anticipated depth. These are actually buried at 10 centimeters depth. So you can see here that uh, all these images, sort of all these artifacts, let's say, right in the in the center of the image, should actually be classified as not as deep as they are in this image. GPR works on time of dist uh, time, and then we anticipate or we calculate distance based upon that. But the time can be different depending on the time it takes to get to an object and for it to be reflected back to the antenna can change as you're scanning. So in a way, this is a, a, an image of the time it has taken for the signal to go back and forth. You can imagine if you were trying to determine where somebody was by calling to them in, the, in, say, the, in say some wilderness situation, and then you hear your own echo from different rocks, you might actually then start to piece together where things are based upon how long it took for that echo to get to you. Uh, but it wouldn't be necessarily a great spatial picture. It would be a great picture of how long things took. Well, in this case, a GPR radiogram image is that sort of situation. Um, as we move along, you'll see the hyperbola structures of these roots start to emerge very very subtly. So as we scan in this in this case, you can see kind of in the center, you see these kind of hyperbola structures. These are associated with the roots that are perpendicular to the image, as well as on an angle. And you can actually see right in this, uh, right at the kind of the top left, uh, you can see a hyperbola emerging as we actually move across uh, perpendicular to that one spruce root. However, we're also moving uh, on, uh, on a route that is parallel to the scan. In this case, it's this very dark area right at the right of the image. And this doesn't give a typical hyperbola structure. This actually gives a very different structure. We know something is there, but it's actually harder to interpret this, this object at this angle. And as we move across, the, the image starts to become more like the one that we started with. Uh, which is less hyperbolic structures and more, more related to uh, you know disturbances within the soil that we would have that we would have made while burying burying the objects, as well as potentially some signal from the the box itself. As I said, at the very bottom of this image, you can see a, a quite a strong signal uh, which is not associated with roots. It's actually the bottom of the box, uh, in the center of the image it's likely that there are some artifacts produced by the sensors that are measuring water moisture, uh, as well as other aspects of the constructed unit uh, and not the roots themselves. So this really is leading to our uh, future work or the work that we're currently conducting. Produce several hundred scans, if not more, and develop a statistical model that improves the classifications of this imagery. This is not new when it comes to uh, non-invasive detection of objects. In fact, in the medical sphere, especially with things like MRI, the use of statistical models is what drives the, the software behind whether your medical professional can actually understand what they're seeing in MRI imagery. Uh, in the same way, GPR requires this sort of statistical model to improve these systems. Now, why would we do a statistical model beyond doing it and having a better understanding of how roots might show up? Well, as, as we said, we wanted to make an, we want to try to develop an automated, an automated software, an automated tool that will be able to take some of the work out of the interpretation of these objects. And so in order to do that, we need to have, we need to have metrics that will, that will be able to place uh, and classify um, uh, root or non-root areas of an image. Um, in order to do that, we need to understand how these variables modify and how they impact the expressions of these roots underground. We've developed a large library that we can now draw upon uh, for the building of this statistical model. We are also looking and developing, looking at and developing uh, uh, 
artificial intelligence and image or computer vision uh, algorithms that will help us to come to a, a, a proper and sophisticated statistical model um, to achieve this purpose. Without uh, tree funds uh, help and resources, we wouldn't have been able to even conceive of a box, a root box like this that would allow us to look at things as they actually happen in the ground uh, and to be able to develop this controlled laboratory. Until then, you know, everybody's just it's their best guess of where, where roots are, not only in the real ground, but it's our best guess as to how they show up in this imagery. It really is a matter of only then experience of the operator and where they can say where a root might be and where they aren't. Essentially, we would have been in the same place that many practitioners with trees are in the field. We can only rely on rules of thumb. Well, hopefully not anymore. Hopefully now with a statistical model and further development of GPR interpretation, uh, we can deploy surveys that will be able to identify roots, root zones, and even non-root zones with confidence in a, in a variety of situations. Thanks. And uh, I think if we can uh, uh, put the last question up on the screen for the audience, we'd like to see um, what you think of this sort of system. Would it be useful for you? Thank you, Andrew and uh, Justin. A fantastic presentation. I just, I'm just going to jump in real quick. It is the top of the hour. For those of you that need to jump off, um, please feel free to do so. Thank you for joining us on the Tree Fund webinar series uh, today. Um, and so I just wanted to say that real quick. We will stick around for maybe two, three minutes of questions. We've got to be respectful of the researchers' time, too. Justin, I'll go ahead and close the poll and we can see. Okay. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine to stay on for you know a few more minutes, whatever, whoever's interested in staying on, I'm, I, I do have the time for that. Um, so this was an interesting, uh, I, I, it's sort of what I anticipated, but it, this is an interesting response to this. Regularly, I think, I think this, you know, 18% makes sense. We don't quite know whether this will be successful yet. We haven't quite developed it fully. Uh, and so uh, it's hard to know whether it would be used regularly. And, and we don't quite know what the limits are yet, whether whether it would, whether something, this kind of technology would be limited to only certain circumstances. And so that really kind of makes sense that it would depend on the use case. Uh, at least the majority in this case uh, say that it depends. Um, and then, of course, uh, I would need more information to decide. Uh, this this dovetails into our expectations as well. We we understand that a system like this is new. And in fact, if we are to bring back the medical analogy again, um, not everybody not every doc doctor knows how to interpret, let's say, MRI imagery, or at least they they are not the ones that are operating the machines that are doing it. So usually, there are specialists involved. Are specialists involved or will they need to be involved with this sort of survey technology? It's unclear yet, but um, the goal of this project is to really uh, make it more accessible, make this technology more accessible. Well, I want to thank both of you real quick. We'll jump into a couple questions, but for people that need to jump off, a fantastic presentation. I, I think this is you know, one of the wonderful things to see some new and emerging research with some new and emerging technology to answer one of those really tough questions that we have is, you know, where are the roots? Uh, you know, talking to people that do tree preservation, you know, and talking about putting out CRZs and we don't know when we do that. And so I think this is fantastic. Thanks to both of you for taking the time to join us here on the Tree Fund web webinar series uh, and share your knowledge. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Some people asked, have you all published anything that people could access? Um, is there anything out there um, that want to do some, some additional reading on this topic? Justin, I can jump in there if you like. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we have two, um, pieces of peer reviewed, uh, um, 
information out there that uh, that we could uh, perhaps make available through the tree fund. Uh, one is in a new uh, international encyclopedia of geography that uh, uh, gives a really nice breakdown of the, the basics of GPR and its various uses uh, with a bit of a focus on tree roots, but also some of the other applications. And uh, Justin is a lead author on that. Um, the second uh, uh, piece that we have was uh, published uh, in the um, uh, the the uh, uh, landscape under the ground uh, presentations uh, that I believe it took place in was it 2018 2019 but uh, there was a peer reviewed article that uh, we did based on a presentation uh, emerging from that that we could uh, we could also uh, make available perhaps when this webinar is posted then you know underneath it or with some ancillary information we could uh, list those uh, list those particular articles um, so that has a a bit more of our early um, description uh, of the um, uh, the use of GPR in, in tree root uh, detection, uh, and it also sort of hints at uh, our next stage that we've presented today, and that is the, the creation of a, of a controlled environment within which we can uh, identify and look in detail at some of the specific characteristics of, of uh, you know, roots based on um, known things that are, are measurable in our, in our lab environment. Perfect. I think that would be fantastic. Uh, for, and we'll do that. And I think Heath um, there at Tree Fund will be able to help us do that because I know there's a lot of interest. There was a lot of questions and I know we've kind of run out of time um, with related to, you know, how this technology works over things like concrete, asphalt, you know, wet soils, clay soils, uh, you know, that would it pick up underground utilities and mistake them for roots? Would it have any? So a lot of questions. Um, related to that, that I, I just don't think we have time in the interests of, of the webinar and, and y'all's time as well. And so, but I can share those questions with both of you and um, maybe at some point it might make a good Q&A at some point in the future. Mm. And so, um, with that, um, I know we're five minutes over, so I'll go ahead if, um, if Andrew and Justin, you're okay, I'll go ahead and move us towards closing the webinar uh, today. Um, I want to thank both of you again for fantastic presentation. It was it was fascinating. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I think the audience did too, at least from the number of questions and comments that we had. Um, and I'll be sharing that information with both of you. Um, I did see a comment from somebody saying it was great to see research um, being done by some Canadians, and I, I just want to emphasize that at Tree Fund, you know, projects are funded across the globe. We do tend to have more of them focused, you know, in North America. There's a lot of universities there, but there's been things funded in Europe. South America and Canada. So it, it is a, a global um, organization. And so it is great to see something um, on this. So thank you all very much. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and close today's webinar. Um, Andrew, Justin, any closing thoughts before I shut us down? Um, I did say earlier on when I uh, when I started to introduce today's topic that if there are any researchers out there that may have an interest in chatting with Justin and I, we're very uh, open to um, uh, to that uh, potential. So uh, through um, you know the uh, I guess when when this particular uh, webinar is posted, then uh, you can find our contact details there as well. Uh, if not, I'm easily findable through um, Toronto Metropolitan University, and when you find me, you're likely to come across Justin there as well. So. Maybe we'll post your emails on the tree fund yeah. website. Careful what you wish for. <laughs> right. Indeed. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot right, well, of it's, 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 yeah, it's been a real pleasure to speak to, to all of you today. And I, I know the same is the case uh, for Justin. So again, thank you for your interest in this and thank you for, uh, you know, for your concern for, for trees. Thank you all very much. Have a good rest of your Tuesday. Good rest of your week. Let's see. It's all saints day. Dia de los Muertos, depending on where you're at. So have a good rest of your day um, and see everybody next month with Jason Gordon uh, from the University of Georgia on the Tree Fund webinar series. Cheers and thanks very much. Happy afternoon. Yeah, bye everyone. Take care.